thank you all for coming to our Middletown City Council candidate forum um, this evening. I'm going to ask that all of you please check your phones. Please make sure you put them on airplane mode or vibrate. I'm going to ask the candidates to do the same. Candidates, I'd like to thank you for putting yourselves out there and running for office um, for your local city. So thank you and congratulations for that. Lenny Robinson is our moderator this evening. So with that, Lenny, it's all yours. Rick, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Good evening to our audience here. and Good evening to you watching at home tonight. It's our pleasure to be here tonight for the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum. And tonight, we're going to be talking to the candidates running for city council as well as for mayor. There are two seats open for city council and one for mayor. There are also three slots for Middletown School Board. And typically, we would have the candidates here for school board. But since the three seats are open and only the three incumbents are running, we felt it was more important to have this group here in front of us now for Middletown City Council to talk with everybody rather than the three incumbents. Also in our audience tonight, running unopposed for uh, a term will be Judge James Sharon, and he's sitting back there, if we can make him welcome. And since he's running unopposed, <laughs> and nobody here has to be in front of him right now, we thank you for being here, Judge. Congratulations. Now, before we get started, you'll notice we have an empty chair. Perry Davis was supposed to be here tonight. Uh, he got called into work unexpectedly, so unfortunately, Mr. Davis cannot join us tonight. So uh, we just want to let you know of that. He was planning on attending. So let's get started. Uh, as I mentioned, we have two candidates for mayor, Nicole Cordray, or Cordry. Condry. Condry, I can say that. I told you I would mess it up, Condry, and Larry Mulligan. And there are just one, there is just one seat available for mayor. And then for council, we have six candidates, and there are two seats open. So let's start by introducing the candidates for city council. We'll begin with Levi Kramer. As we said, Perry Davis is gone tonight. We have John P. Hart II, Tal Moon, Monica Nenny, Joe Whiteman, Whitman. Whitman, I messed that up as well, and the aforementioned Nicole Condry and Larry Mulligan. So let's start things and have everybody introduce themselves. The ground rules are they have two minutes to uh, tell us their entire life story and why they want to run for council. So, Mr. Kramer, we'll start with you. Yes. Well, I'd like to first start by thanking the Chamber of Commerce for doing this event this evening, as well as all of you for being here this evening. Uh, my name is Levi J. Kramer, and of course, I am running for Middletown City Council. I'm a proud fifth generation Middletonian. The Kramers moved here in the late 1800s because they wanted a piece of the American dream. They found it here in Middletown. My great grandfather, Judge Fred B. Kramer, served this community for over 40 years, still to this day holding the record for longest serving judge in Ohio history. His son, my grandfather, was a congressional staffer for many years. So service to this community is a family tradition. It runs in my blood. And it's a tradition that I have been taking part in as well. I sit on the board for Keep Middletown Beautiful here in town as well as uh, I serve as the vice president of the Middletown Parades Committee. After graduating from Middletown High School, I went on to The Ohio State University, where I graduated a year early and debt-free. While I was there, I had the privilege of serving as the Senior Director of Governmental Affairs for the over 50,000 students that called Ohio State home. I got to work with Columbus City Council. I testified in front of the Ohio General Assembly. I met and lobbied with uh, United States Congressman and even once the Vice President of the United States on behalf of the 50,000 students that called Ohio State home. But it's simply, I was their voice. It's not a responsibility that I took lightly. In fact, it's one of the greatest privileges I've ever had in my entire life. Uh, and it's that sort of mindset that I intend on bringing to this chamber. The Book of Romans says that if your gift is serving others, you must serve them well. That's why over the course of these last few weeks, the theme of my campaign has been a voice for the people. Because that is what we need. Someone on council that will serve you and serve you well. Not themselves or any sort of uh, special business interests that they may have. I'll be the first one to tell you, I don't own a business. I have no financial ties downtown, airport, anywhere else here in town. Uh, the only property I own is the house that I live in. And it's fitting that I am sitting sort of separate here because I am the only one here today that can say that. Uh, my one and only agenda here is serving this town. My name is Levi J. Kramer. I'm proud to call Middletown home. And I hope that you will give me the opportunity to work with you to make it an even better home. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. Mr. Hart. Awesome. My name is John Hart. I've been a business owner here in Middletown for 11 years with uh, Start Skydiving. I, I 
I've been a serial entrepreneur my entire life. I have 100 and probably 60 employees between my businesses. Uh, they're faith-based, veteran-owned. I served 20 years in the United States military. I retired as a first sergeant with the 19th Special Forces Group. I uh, served my country in different ways, different places, and I uh, was very proud of that. I built a business here. Uh, we were in Warren County and came here because the city asked us to come here. They wanted the excitement, and we brought it here and built the number one skydiving center in the world. And uh, about 45,000 people a year come to Middletown that wouldn't normally come here because of our business. So why am I running? Uh, as that business, I've, uh, I've realized that we aren't friendly to businesses, and that's why we don't grow. And as a businessman, I see the breakdowns and the problems, and I try to address them here, but unfortunately, it doesn't happen. And it got to the point to where you should have had a wind tunnel in Middletown, but you don't. You've got one out on Liberty Center in Westchester. You should have had other things, aerospace and research projects here, but you don't because it didn't fit the plan. So the plan has to change. If you want your economy to grow, you need to put people on this council that know how to grow it. If you, uh, you want to stay the way you are, that's what you need to do. I'm all over the paper. I've got nothing to hide. My life is, is public. Um, so I put myself out here because I care. I care a lot. I'm a philanthropist. I give. I've created foundations. Since I've been a businessman, I've donated close to half a million dollars to charities in this community. I've never said no to anybody that's ever come here for help. And so I expose myself to make a difference. And I'm going to make a difference. I don't know what the word withdrawal means. I've never turned away and ran from a gunfight. And I won't. And I'm not going to. And I'm John Hart. And I'm running for city council. No. I'm running for you. Because right. I actually care. All right. Thank you. Mr. Moon, on to you. Good evening. I, I too would like to thank the Chamber of Commerce and the Government Relations Committee for hosting tonight's forum. This election is of critical importance for the future of our community. Growing up in Middletown has made me a better, more well-rounded person because it's given me the ability to understand people of all different backgrounds and life situations. We have all walks of life here, and I'm proud that we don't all come from the same life experience and circumstance. I was born and raised here, a fifth-generation Middletonian. I graduated from Middletown High School and then Miami University. I'm an agency owner at Moon and Adrian Insurance, which was founded by my great-grandfather nearly 100 years ago. I'm married to my incredible wife, Sarah Lynn, who is a high school teacher, and I have two boys, Jack, who's three, and Iggy, who's two. I learned many things growing up here, and those included a responsibility to help my neighbor and to serve my community. I do not believe that when we face challenging times that we should turn our heads and hope the problem goes away but rather to engage and serve one another. That background and heart from, for Middletown is what has led me to run for Middletown City Council. I'm running because I believe in our city and its people. I want more for Middletown. I want more jobs, more opportunity, better roads, and revitalized neighborhoods. I've been fighting for change, the way we, fighting to change the way we operate for the last four years, and re, if reelected, I'll continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Monica Nenny, you are up. Tell us about you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, I am Monica Nenny, and I would like the privilege of being your next city council person. I live on North Highview, and I own and operate West Central Wine and Gold Beret Boutique in downtown Middletown. Uh, I was born and raised in Middletown, attended Wilson Elementary and John 23rd. I graduated from Fenwick High School, and I earned a degree in communications from Miami University in Oxford. I never left very far. Um, after school, I lived and worked in Over the Rhine in downtown Cincinnati. I fell in love with the city and marveled at the urban revitalization that it was experiencing, but it wasn't home. I moved back to Middletown four years ago with a desire to bring the energy of places like Over the Rhine to our own city's core. I care about Middletown. I want to improve the public education experience by supporting our students and their leaders. I want to facilitate equal opportunities for economic development. I want to focus on public safety by listening to the concerns of our citizens and its officers. And I want to build a strong community of neighbors, business owners, and leaders who can be proud to call Middletown home. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Joe Whitman, your turn. Thank you. 
I'm Joe Whitman, and I'm thrilled and proud to see so many people in attendance tonight, as well as so many candidates in the race to help make this city a better place. I was born and raised in Middletown and cast my vote, first vote here 41 years ago. Middletown has changed a lot since then. The resurgence of our downtown is due to the power of individuals who stood up and took chances. Everyone who was involved in those efforts worked very hard and deserves credit, including our city government. I became interested in determining how the city reached their decisions. I started to review council meetings and soon realized that executive sessions were used over 85% of the time. It seemed shocking to me, so I checked other cities in our region and none of them came close to that number. Our city government is perceived as a place where many feel they have no voice. I believe there is a culture that discourages open dialogue within city staff that emanates from the top. I am running in large part to change our city and make our government more transparent. I want to see a culture of openness and collaboration between city management, staff, and council. I want to make it clear I'm not running as an angry citizen, but rather a deeply concerned one that has been committed to making Middletown a better place for many years. I serve on the board of the Art Central Foundation. I'm on the executive committee of the Ohio Hot Air Balloon Challenge. I also have served as a secretary and vice president of the Middletown NAACP. I will let my commitment to Middletown speak for itself through my actions over the last 15 years. We will all answer questions regarding policy tonight, and I think we all agree we want clean drinking water, sewers that work, roads that don't damage our cars, and police and fire protection that will be there when we need it. We are a strong community and deserve leadership that will move us into our future with openness and accountability. I hope you will join me in bringing positive change to Middletown. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. And these are our candidates for Middletown City Council. Two seats are open. Of these five here tonight, plus Mr. Davis, who could not be here, you will vote for two of those. Now let's go on to the mayor's race. We have two people running for mayor, and let's have them introduce themselves right now. We'll begin with Nicole Condry. I'm Nicole Condry, and I'm a citizen of Middletown. Uh, my background is in U.S. foreign diplomacy, so I had 15 years of federal service to our nation, uh, domestic and foreign soil, and then I turned a professional skydiver, of all things, uh, with my husband. So we're proudly spreading patriotism all around, uh, not only our country, but other countries as well. Uh, and we have a culture of giving back on our team that's unprecedented. I'm also the widow of a 25-year Navy veteran. What is a mayor? I believe that a mayor is a leader. It's someone who can rally the troops, unite them, and help them recognize the shared mission that they're in and help them accomplish that together. A mayor is someone who puts his or her ego aside, who listens to all parties, who has the strength to make decisive and informed decisions, and then to defend those decisions. A mayor is an ambassador or a diplomat an ambassador or diplomat of our citizens, of our land, of our businesses, of our culture, and of our shared dream for the future. A mayor is responsible for cultivating our relationships with our neighbors. They're responsible for defending the livelihood of this city. To do that, we have to communicate. And I think that's one of my strengths. I also think that the city is breaking down because of a failure to communicate in many ways. This campaign has been an incredible journey for me. The minority of people seem to want some sort of political drama out of it, while the majority are passionate, energetic, full of ideas, and willingness to follow through. They just need the leadership to point them in the right direction and the tools to accomplish things. It's funny because I've seen both sides of the fence seem to kind of fight over um, who, which side I belong to. And I think for a nonpartisan position that Middletown find, found the right mayoral candidate uh, to lead and unite this city, into greatness in 2020. Thank you very much. And Mr. Mulligan. Thank you, Lenny. Uh, good evening. It's, I'd like to express my thanks to the chamber and uh, to the citizens for showing up tonight. It's a certainly great to see the great turnout and appreciate the uh, support of the chamber in uh, leading and organizing tonight's forum. Middletown's made some great progress over the past 12 years. I've served as mayor and really proud of that history. We've made progress on many fronts. We've been paving more streets. 
We've added over a billion dollars in commercial development, a billion dollars with a B. Working with the private sector to create jobs, we're addressing tough issues like our blighted and nuisance properties, and we're dealing with the opioid crisis and other issues. With this progress comes a need for experienced leadership to see this good work through to the end. To me, that looks like a continued commitment to a number of things, funding our roads, preparing our workforce to meet the needs of new and growing businesses in town, and carrying out our new housing plan that addresses areas of blight and disrepair with really long-term solutions. I'm grateful to the city for your trust and commitment to the future, to, for my commitment to the future of Middletown. I've been part of the solution thus far and am prepared to lead the way forward. Professionally, I serve as an Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Lebanon Citizens National Bank, LCNB National Bank in Lebanon. Uh, I've been a lifelong banker, a lot of experience in finance and executive leadership. I've been able to use that uh, to be the ambassador for the city, to be the representative as the charter calls for for the city. I'm also proud of my history here in town. I'm a lifelong fourth generation Middletonian. My wife and I raised a fifth generation of Mulligans in town. It is our home. I'm committed to our hometown and I'm proud of my record as mayor and the progress we've made and the challenges we've overcome. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Now to all the candidates, you've been given the, the general topics which we will be pulling questions for you to answer. You have no idea what the questions are. I just got them today. So uh, we're going to ask the questions, but we're going to go back to the mayor's race. And let's start with, with the mayor's race. And, and again, I applaud all of you. We only have two incumbents here at this table. And so all of you that are running for the, and everybody is running for the first time, with, with the exception of the two incumbents, and I think that is absolutely awesome. And, and I think on behalf of every Middletonian, they should applaud you for wanting to step up and represent the city in the best way that you see fit. So, it, and it makes me smile when you see, Mr. Mulligan, you have been the first and only mayor elected by the people of Middletown when the Ward District went away and, and we voted everybody at large. And as we look at Nicole Condry, first time coming into politics and you jump right in, pardon the pun, with, uh, with both feet and, and a working shoot, and um, you want to run for mayor. What's your inspiration? Tell me, tell me what your inspiration is for wanting to jump into politics and starting out off at the top. Sure. Well, uh, I recently finally decided that I was going to give up my federal uh, government job, which I originally went away from uh, because to help with my husband and his illnesses. So uh, came here and made the decision to move to Middletown and become a citizen here. I have this whole gap in my, um, my being, right? I miss that federal service um, to others and to this country. And I feel like this position is not only one that serves this city, but in a le true leadership role. And I have been a leader of every group or organization I've ever been a part of. I've led from within, and I think it's finally time I stepped up and leaded, uh, led from a higher position than just within. Now, Mr. Mulligan, mm -hmm. you've been the mayor, so people who run and serve on, on councils throughout the country go, man, it's, it's, I, I've served my time. So your inspiration to do this again, tell us about that. Well, a lot of it goes to the history we've laid over the past 12 years. I think we've got a great, uh, we've laid out a great runway to keep the airport and skydiving theme going, uh, but uh, we need to see it through. Uh, we've accomplished a lot of great things, uh, but we're also on the cusp of many more great things. The housing study we completed over the past couple of years is going to lay out some great opportunities for the future. Uh, we've get, got some great opportunities with Cincinnati and Dayton coming together as a metroplex, more likely in 2020 for the census. So there's a lot of opportunities, I think, ahead of us, and I think we can build upon uh, a lot of the progress we've made and uh, lead that in the future. I'm looking forward to that. All right, thank you. Now we'll move on to uh, the candidates. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Hart. You mentioned about economic development. Things have changed over the years, and, and I think everybody will agree where we were 10 years ago to where we are now, Middletown has changed dramatically. Um, but the question I want to ask you is it's about the available workforce. You employ a lot of people. You help people find jobs as well. So if you're on city council and I'm a businessman that says I want to come to the city of Middletown, I want to bring my company here, Who's going to work my jobs? What are you going to answer, given the assets that the city of Middletown has? Uh, we have unemployment, 4% or less. How would you approach this businessman to help him fill his jobs for his workforce? I think we have to look at what we're attracting. 
uh, I, I think if we're looking for industrial-based uh, businesses, it's not necessarily a great thing for Middletown. I think if we're looking for positions that are technology-based, that are service-based, then we've got such a huge community, like you said, a Metroplex is the possibility between Cincinnati and Dayton. People will drive that distance. If we don't have the workforce in Middletown, but we bring the proper businesses to Middletown, people will come here, they will work, they will drive 30, 45 minutes to work for those organizations. So as far as workforce development, I believe that comes after you've developed the business force. And I don't think that our economic development plan focuses on the small businesses, the businesses that create 20, 25 jobs. I think we're looking for that big elephant. And uh, I think we need to change that mindset because the workforce is here. The workforce is within 75 miles of Middletown to support the businesses that we should attract. Mr. Boone, same question. I'm a, I'm, I'm a business, I want to come to Middletown, but <coughs> trying to find that worker is a tough task to do right now. So you're on council, what do you say to this business that says, hey, how, how will the city help me fill these jobs? Sure, I think the MSA that we've talked about, the Metropolitan Statistical Area, uh, it, we market ourselves as that already. 2021, it's likely gonna happen. We're gonna be a Minneapolis, St. Paul, a Dallas, Fort Worth. We'll be a top 20 MSA in the entire country. That puts you on a whole nother list for economic development. I think we're already on the track. We have Cincinnati State, we have Butler Tech, um, we have Miami Regionals, and the game changer that I think is in the mix is the Work Plus program uh, that you can get at, at Miami Hamilton now, starting at Miami Middletown next year. Um, you can go to college for free. You can work at a local employer, um, and they'll, they'll pay for you to go to college. There's even some consideration given to a stipend for housing. To have that in Middletown next year, that's going to be incredible. And a piece of that, I'm kind of branching off a little bit on workforce, but finding them available housing so that they're living in Middletown, spending their dollars in Middletown, that's a big piece of the workforce for me. All right. Monica Nenny, I'm going to ask you the same question. You're a small business owner. I get that. And you may have trouble finding good qualified candidates. So how would you answer yourself of saying, if you're coming to city council, I need help in filling three jobs. Where are you going to find that? Yeah, I mean, I think that we have to focus on actionable uh, opportunities, right? So I think having opportunities for people from local high schools and college programs like the ones that we talked about are important to having, uh, you know, we have to have engagement from the businesses, I would say, in those, um, uh, forums for people who want to find jobs, internet forums, uh, job fairs, and those sort of things. We have to get more of our small businesses to engage in those opportunities for finding employees. Uh, too many of them are not connected. Uh, I think creating those connections between our different uh, uh, educational uh, workforce uh, suppliers, uh, people who are putting people into the workforce uh, would be an opportunity for me. But I do think that affordable housing is a thing that people struggle with. Thank you. Mr. Whitman, I'm going to change things up a little bit. Let's focus on Mr. Job. Robinson, before you move on yes. topic, I'd just like to jump in. If I could, you asked us to jump in, right? I did. May I? You may. All right. I just want to give the uh, some kudos to the chamber because they've done a lot in terms of uh, public-private partnerships with workforce development in the area. They brought together a combination of groups with business retention as well as an education task force that's done a lot uh, behind the scenes, and that's certainly been a great collaboration and partnership we've had with the city, and I appreciate the chamber's work. Thank on. you for the plug for the chamber. <laughs> Mr. Whitman, I'm going to ask you something about downtown Middletown. It continues to evolve and reinvent itself. Ten years ago, it was a place no one wanted to go to. Now you drive through there at night, there's a lot of activity there, you see new businesses uh, that are popping up and, and, and starting to evolve, and, and downtown Middletown obviously is changing. Um, so my question is, if you're on council, is it a hands-off or hands-on for city council to work with downtown Middletown, or do you let the market dictate? How would you approach? I think it's a combination. Uh, downtown is doing so good because so many individuals came out and put their lives on the line or, or their money on the line and ha have started mom and pop businesses. City uh, at the beginning I think was a great help getting things started down there uh, but I think we've evolved to a point where we should let downtown do what downtown's gonna do. So you're in favor of hands-off? I, I would be in favor of a handout 
I would like to see the city, instead of trying to plan everything, actually let people do their jobs, developers come in and develop properties, and find a way to help those developers. Okay, Nicole Condry, are you of the same mindset? Are you, are you looking to say, hey, you're a downtown business, we're gonna give you a handout, as Mr. Whitman says, or do you, are you their partner? What's your take on this? Well, I think what Joe probably, partially when he said handout, means reaching a handout, say, hey, we're here to help, and if we can help you through the red tape, I think that's really what he meant. I, I actually, yeah. can I clarify, yeah. yeah. So um, I think that the, the city can help kickstart some things downtown, like um, helping to create more white box stores so that they're a little bit more finished um, and actually ready for businesses to move in because I think we're asking an awful lot for a lot of these small businesses to kick all those funds in uh, to start a new business like many of these people have, which is impressive. But if we can help them kickstart that and get this up and running faster, that would be great. I also think we need to stop these dollar sales of uh, buildings downtown uh, without any sort of um, expectations. We've got a lot of buildings sitting there that nothing's ever happened, and we've given a lot of $1 sales away. Well, you mentioned $1 sales, but let me go back to something you just said about creating a white box. As, as a commercial real estate developer, that takes money. It does. I know that. And when you're dealing with the older buildings in downtown Middletown, you're going into a host of issues, anywhere from lead-based paint to uh, asbestos issues. So you say you don't want to sell buildings for a dollar, but are you advocating that the city spend money to make a white box? So what I mean by the the $1 sales is not just sell it for a dollar and not have something in place to say, hey, these are the expectations we have for you to accomplish by a certain date, and here's what happens if they don't happen by that date, because I don't think we're keeping people accountable. Okay. Mr. Mulligan, Mulligan on to you. Downtown, mm -hmm. hands on, hands off, hand out, shake hands, what are we doing? <laughs> Probably all of the above has been said, but uh, no, I, I think we've got a great track record downtown in terms of bringing things back. A lot of it started with Jane Linda Mormon when they kind of put their flag in downtown and brought that building back. It was a partnership with the city before I was on council that uh, uh, gave them some funding that the city was gonna spend to tear that down, and that's been leveraged to things like the Pendleton, uh, to uh, facade improvement programs, uh, we're working through some creative stuff with Steve Kuhn uh, to get some downtown residential market rate housing in place. And there are other developers that are in interested as well in terms of some of the properties uh, that are available and, uh, and the city owns or doesn't own. Uh, we've also had some challenges too. I'll admit uh, the Manchester has not played out the way we thought it would. And it's taken some time to work through that and we're actively pursuing that and holding people accountable to it. But uh, things unfortunately, uh, when you get the courts involved, it takes a little bit of time. All right, Levi Kramer, we haven't forgotten about you. You're sitting over here on my left. Um, we're talking about downtown, but Middletown consists of more than just downtown. And there are business owners today that are going, hey, a lot of focus has been given on downtown Middletown. And they go, well, that's great. You've got these new businesses starting, but we invested out here on this road or on this street. And they're asking, what about me? So what would your response as a city council member be to those people who are going, I'm not in downtown, but I, I still need some help? Sure, and I'm, you know, and I'm glad you asked, uh, you phrased it that way. Um, you know, it, it's wonderful what we're doing down on Central Avenue, and I, I love seeing what's happening downtown. When, you know, a couple of years ago when I was at Middletown High School, you wouldn't want to be caught there after dark, and that's not the case anymore. So it's wonderful that we've seen uh, the progression downtown that we have. But it's exactly what you said. Middletown is more than just downtown. If we want to see economic, sustainable, gro sustainable economic growth, we have to see that across the city as a whole. We are right off of I-75 with some wonderful opportunities right off of that highway that we are not tapping into right now. But what about the, what about the business owner today? He's in business, he's opening his doors, he's seeing the, the hands come out for downtown. The guy on, the guy on Central Avenue out uh, a mile from downtown or two miles from downtown, what do you tell that person? Sure, we make it easier for that person to open shop. Uh, I mean, we, we look at situations like uh, that Waffle House that wanted to come in, they wanted to put a, a billboard up the same size as the other billboards in the area. City steps in and says, nope, you can't do that. Uh, designed to wear downtown. They wanted to uh, put a sandwich board in front of their shop advertising their services. They had to create a proposal for what that board was going to look like. They had to put it in front of a zoning commission to get that okayed. All those sort of policies do are drive our businesses to other communities. So if you make it easier for these businesses to open shop in this area and you make it uh, a conducive environment for them to grow, you can see those sort of benefits without heavy city involvement. Mr. Hart, same question. As a business owner, and 
you're kind of downtown at the airport, but let's downtown. Yes. I, uh, but, but what about what about the person that's that's on the East End or somewhere else, and they're going? We see all this stuff going downtown. What about me? Well, I don't see all this stuff going on downtown. I see um, a lot of entrepreneurs who put a lot of risk and build a business, and and they struggle downtown. And I don't. I think everybody says the effort is going to downtown. It's those business people that are putting in the effort. I believe that we've done some good things at the interchange with the overhaul and the look of it. But for Middletown, it needs to be a red carpet from the minute they get off the exchange to be able to get to downtown. And that whole area should be revitalized and, and cleaned up and, and be presenting for the businesses that want to grow because we want them to go downtown because they're going to go by every other business to get there and they're going to see it. And the opportunity to shop, to use those businesses is available to them. So downtown is a catalyst for economic growth. And the more we put into downtown, it's going to drive people from the interstate past all these businesses. They're not going to avoid them. They're going to see that they're there. Right now, if you, if you say downtown businesses shouldn't be an investment and we focus on just on the interstate, then everything in between isn't going to be seen. Okay, thank you. Mr. Robinson, could I jump in? Yes. Uh, we've done things like this in the past. Um, for example, dedicated, motivated. It, ultimately, it's about return on investment. Uh, what's the city's going to what's the city's return on investment going to be and if there's somebody in a different part of the city that's going to open a business and want some incentive from the city bring it to us i think we would listen to it we've done it with dedicated motivated we did it with uh bw3s we waived sewer and tap fees i i think this council and previous councils have, have been open to doing that so you're saying i'm a small business owner and i'm not downtown yeah and i'm going to come to the city we do that now you do that i, I, I like to say i say he's a hypocrite because my business has been here 11 years and I've had a lease that they've never honored. And I bring 40, 45,000 people a year to Middletown. So to say that we're business friendly is not true. This council does not do that. I stood before this council a year ago and said, be honorable men and women. Do the right thing. Honor your commitments. We don't do that. We're not business friendly here. We are not business friendly and we need to change that we, we treat businesses that want to come here and that are currently here. Mr. Moon, comment. Uh, I would say I've served on the airport commission for almost three years. Uh, I've talked to Mr. Hart multiple times. Uh, his complaints never came up in our conversations uh, prior to him coming down here and all this bubbling up, and um, I wish we'd been able to address it. I wasn't on council when you came here the first time, uh, and we should have met our commitments, and I would like to think we're working to do that right now. All right, thank you. And any other comments following up on that? Because you were going to have the same question about helping the small business owner that's not downtown. Um, I, I think I would just okay. stick with kind of what I mentioned. I, I think we'd be happy to have. All right, Monica Can Nenny. Touch on that for a minute. Go ahead, Mr. Kirby. You know, and it's great what we're seeing with places like Buffalo Wild Wings and all these other restaurants that are paying minimum wage and ten dollar an hour jobs down there. But that's not the answer to sustainable economic growth. When we see uh, an area of the city as a whole having a median household income lower than the county and lower than the state, we need to target more career based jobs that are bringing in you know, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year. Uh, you know, it's wonderful that we're opening all of these restaurants, but unless we can get something that's actually going to uh, allow people to buy these homes that we're building here, it, it, it's a short-term gain. Could I touch on that real quick? Because we did have about 130 jobs of Kettering Medical Center uh, come to town. Uh, they're expanding. They've got a ribbon cutting coming up next week. Uh, those are pretty attractive healthcare industry jobs that are happening. Uh, we did uh, partner with NTE. They built a $600 million facility here in town. Uh, those are high-paying engineering jobs. Uh, Suncoke, my first year on council, has about 100 jobs, and those are all um, pretty nice jobs, and uh, I think we partner with a lot of uh, businesses to help, help build theirs, but I, I think we've got a decent track record of that. Right. It has been mentioned a couple of times about the interchange, and Monica Nenny, this question is for you. Curb appeal. In real estate, everybody knows. Curb appeal is what sells, helps sell the property. So our curb appeal, Mr. Hart, you mentioned it, the interchange. So. Do you like what we have now? What would you do to improve it? And how do we get there? What would, be, what would be your vision for taking the interchange we have now? I guess that's the question, and making it better. Yeah, I think we have a lot of opportunities on the East End. I can also say growing up in Middletown, I remember when our interchange was one of the most dangerous interchanges on I-75. So we've come a long way since then. Um, and I think our curb appeal has increased a lot. Um, I think that, like Mr. Hart said, there is an opportunity to improve the entire gateway from the interchange all the way down to the river. And the curb appeal doesn't stop at one end or the other. It's everywhere in between. And we've got to start 
holding our neighbors more accountable for home maintenance, building owners more accountable for the way that they maintain their buildings, making white box spaces available for new businesses to touch on downtown, I can tell you that a vibrant downtown will attract the things that fall in between. And it's our responsibility as a city to not let downtown take the rap every time that someone says, well, what's going on in the rest of town? Thank you. you know? Mr. Whitman, I'm going to move to you. The curb appeal of the city of Middletown. Do you like what we have now? If not, what's your vision? What would you like to see out of the interchange? We have nine interchanges between uh, 670 and, and, and 275. We're one of nine. The other ones have done different things. What would, what's your vision for people? I would like to see us look if we could get another one to open up our city even more. I know that would take a lot of work, but if we had more access to the interstate, a lot of the uh, land value out in that area would go up. We could have more housing come in, more development come in. Uh, AK Research is out there. Uh, the land across from Atrium Medical Center is at a premium, from what I understand. My concerns are, would be with the town mall. It is underperforming and has been underperforming for 20 years. We have to have something done about that. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Well, I was going to say, we as a county, as economic, we have an economic development department, uh, but that would seem to fall under their purview. We have a Target store out there that's sitting empty, and really, coming into Middletown, it gives us a black eye. Well, as a, as a city councilman, mm -hmm. you're getting into private business. Mm -hmm. Is that the role of, city, uh, of a city councilman to involve themselves in individual properties? No, I don't think it is. Okay. But I think you can have talks with the people that own that property and say, you are severely underperforming and you're giving us a black eye in our city. You can't just have you know, vacant buildings sitting there forever with two stores. Well, let's move on to that. Nicole Condry, I'm going to ask you the question, following up from Mr. Whitman. So we've got empty spaces. Now, 10 years ago, we had a whole bunch of empty space, but we had people that did invest in the town mall and bought it when it was dead, that we've had some repurposing of that. But let's get on to economic incentives. You're the mayor of Middletown. What do you offer these property owners who have underperforming properties? What do, what do you do as economic incentives to help get those repurposed, redone, rebuilt? What do you do? I think this actually, to stick, take a step back here, the, the role of city council and mayor is to keep the uh, city manager accountable and him doing his job, and he oversees the economic development department, which in this city right now is woefully underperforming. I don't think they're going out and finding the new business that's needed. I think they're having discussions with who knows whom, but there's, I, I do believe there's executive sessions and there are things going on, and I know that that is the case. I think some of that is unnecessarily put into executive sessions, but I, we need a new economic development department because their job is to go find these businesses and to find these incentives and then bring them to council and bring them to the mayor and say, hey, here's what we found. What do you think about these options? And we don't have that going on right now. Well, l l let me stop you right there. I'm an industrial and commercial real estate developer. That's my job. It's my job to go out. I've got properties to sell. I've got to go out and find those businesses. I don't rely upon any government to do my job for me. As you just said, it's the economic development. Are you, so are you saying that the economic development department should do my job? What I'm saying is they need to attract you to bring your job here, to bring your work here, and they need to incentivize you and make you want to do better and to grow and to take the, pride in, in... The other part of that is we have to have the available properties. Yes. I think we have plenty of available properties in this city for economic growth. Okay. Mr. Mulligan, I'll ask you the same question. Mm -hmm. We've got some empty buildings out by the interstate, and we want to get those full. What are the tools? What are the economic incentives that you would see? Well, there, there's a number we've put in play already. Some of it comes down to uh, the TIF. We have the TIF for infrastructure improvements, and we've used that to uh, build um, streets and expand them, uh, do the infrastructure we need. Uh, there are tax abatements we use for um, and job incentive, um, job creation incentive grants that we make in terms of uh, refunding some of the income taxes that are paid. Uh, but moving back in terms of the bigger picture, in terms of um, economic development in the state of Ohio, a lot of that falls to Jobs Ohio, and uh, we're partners with Ready Cincinnati, uh, the economic development group in Cincinnati that's led by the state, as well as the DDC in, um, in Dayton, 
And those partnerships are what essentially funnel down a lot of the economic development prospects that come uh, from larger developers looking for significant sites. And we're actively responding to those through our partnerships at Ready and uh, DDC. Well, let, let's follow up. I, I, I know, Ms. Condre, you said about helping businesses. Down on the south end of Middletown in the Maid Industrial Park, Opus built a, a, a very large building right there at the corner of Todd Hunter and Yankee Road. It still sits empty today while other properties are full. So uh, there's the building. It's sitting there. There's nobody in it. So you're the mayor. What's your direction to the city manager, to the economic development director? What do you say to those people? Well, I'd like them to do some research and come up with some proposals. I mean, I'm going to do my own research because that's what I do, and I don't know much about that building, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I do, but I know that I'm going to do research and figure out the best options, and I will bring those to the table as best as I can. I don't know that property, and I, I can't give an example. I, I don't know. Okay, Mr. Mulligan, any thoughts on, on the Opus building? Same question. Yeah, it's, well, I mean, it's a new, new project. We were uh, excited to have Opus come and do that facility. It was a spec building. We knew they were looking for potential partners there. And again, that's the private sector uh, investing in the middle of town and doing some great things. And uh, we're partnering with them as best we can. Uh, as, as you know, it, it takes a little bit to uh, attract uh, the right user to the right building. And uh, the fact we have that inventory is a great feather in a cap. And I think it'll open up some additional opportunities and uh, made down the road. Okay, Mr. Kramer, you're on city council. Uh, we've talked about small business, and, and now we're talking about the East End attracting uh, to get these bigger boxes filled. As a city council member, is it your job? Is it your charge? What do, what do you do? Hands off. You go hands off. Uh, reason for that, you look at places like uh, Liberty, uh, Liberty Township, Westchester, they are killing us in business growth right now. Uh, it's because it's frankly more beneficial to open a business there. Uh, look, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be a Middletonian. I've got a lot of Middletown pride. And I would love to see business owners that feel that way too. But at the end of the day, business owners are here to make a profit. And we need to create a situation where that business owner can be profitable. Uh, and when we throw hurdle after hurdle after hurdle to our businesses, all we do is see them drive to other places like uh, like where you see the uh, corporate headquarters for AK sits in Westchester today. If we make it easier for businesses to operate here, we can see that growth come in. All right. Larry, can I say something? I think tax inc increment financing is an, an abysmal product. Um, it effectively bypasses the public budget uh, process, and it lacks complete transparency. And I think that we abuse TIFs. And I, I don't think TIFs are a solution when we're talking about using TIFs for, for doing things. It's like the Ryan Holmes deal. It fell through because Franklin wasn't going to approve the TIF. I think we do too many TIFs. And the only TIF that I think should be used in Middletown is for mixed-use redevelopment projects downtown or the town mall area. But if a TIF is credit enhanced, what's the risk to the city? Well, it depends if it's credit enhanced. But they're not all credit enhanced TIFs. So it really depends on a lot of these TIFs are given and they're, they're approved in executive session. So I think we've got to be careful with TIFs. I think TIFs are, are not approved in executive session because it also involves a school board. That's so you, true. So you do have a lot of transparency, as you mentioned, because there are certain standards that have been set up that if it's over a certain percentage over a certain number of years, and I know the Middletown City Schools have an agreement right. with the city that says if you're over a certain percentage so many years, then you have to come to the schools. But I also know on the back end that TIFs, actually schools don't mind them because if, if it's not a 100% TIF, they don't have TIFs don't have to be given. And, and there's an example. Why isn't Target here? Because they didn't have enough land to expand their building. Well, they wanted to put a grocery store in, too. Right, they didn't have enough land. And we didn't also necessarily want them to put the grocery store in. So there was some land. They could have done the modifications. The, no, I, I, actually, I talked to Target about that, and, and okay. there wasn't enough land. The uh, paper said it was one of the 10 worst performing ones in the country. That's why they shut it down. And it just all comes down to what we present to businesses. We need to make it so those businesses can perform well. Let's, let's move on. Um, Mr. Moon, I'm going to start with you. We've talked about incentives, and typically incentives are tied to jobs. <coughs> and when the deal is made, everybody's happy. Three years down the road, let's say that business is, not, is underperforming. What do you do as a city council member? Uh, we have a committee called the Tax Incentive Review Committee. It reviews all those deals. It involves uh, auditors from both counties, meaning Butler and Warren, uh, local accountants, financial experts, our, our finance committee. And if they're not meeting uh, their commitment, then their incentive is either revoked or scaled back. As well as school board treasurers serve on that too. Monica Nenny, your, your answer to the question. 
I guess I have a question okay. about the question. How many times typically does that happen uh, that someone is not able to fulfill their... It all depends on the company. You may have a company come in that has a great track record, and as Mr. Moon said, there is a committee to review that. But the question is, as a council member, regardless of what happens, if they're underperforming, what do you do as a city council member to say that company, do you pull the incentive? What, what do you do as a council member? I mean, I guess I would say that it all is on a case-by-case -case basis because we've got to, we've got to try to pull those businesses up and try to help to make them successful and figure out what they need from us as a city and what we can provide to them in order to turn their business around. And if that's not an option, then sometimes we do have to draw a hard line with businesses and incentives. Mr. Whitman. Well, You're I hate to say the same thing, but uh, that would be it. As a part of, as a city council member, I'm going to sit here with five other people. We're going to review all of the circumstances of that business. I would like to see the city be as you know helpful as it possibly could. If a business is going to fail, it's going to fail, and you don't want to throw good money after bad. But let's say you have a business out there, they're doing everything right, but for whatever reason, maybe it's the economy, maybe it's bad investment, whatever it is, they're struggling, but you see that they're doing, are you going to put addition, are you going to come to them and say, look, we're going to try to help you, economic development, we're going to try to help you and find ways to maybe loan you some money, would, would you be in favor of that? I don't think loan money, no, but maybe defer payments. Okay, all right. I'm going to go on and ask a mayor's question again. Mr. Mulligan, I'm going to start with you. It's always great as a mayor to be having a, one of those gold shovels in your hand and breaking ground on new mm -hmm. dirt. That's, that's the mayor's job. But sometimes there's tragedies, and you are the face. You are the voice of Middletown. Mm -hmm. What makes you that person to be the spokesperson for Middletown when the cameras and the microphones are rolling? What qualifies you to be that person? Well, part of it comes down to, I think, a, a wide uh, experience level. I've served in a lot of different capacities in terms of nonprofit sector as well as the private sector and banking. Uh, you know, I think my education uh, did a lot. I grew up here in Middletown, so I can speak to a lot of life experiences here in Middletown. And, uh, you know, I think it's a matter of stepping up. I look at it as a challenge to represent the city in, in all facets and believe it's an honor to do so. And I'm always humbled by the, uh, by the experience and uh, look forward to continue to do so. Nicole Cordry, same question. You are the mayor. You're breaking ground. It's great. You give great speeches. But we got, we've got a bad situation. It's a tragedy. It, it's ugly. Everybody from everywhere is here. What qualifies you to be that spokesperson to represent the city of Middletown on camera? I'll tell you what. I spent two years in Khartoum, Sudan, in Africa, uh, representing the United States of America when the U.S. had economic sanctions on their country that were to be quite honest, totally unjust. Um, there was a lot of lobbyist issues going on, and I spent two years of my life defending the United States of America in a very difficult situation. Every day of my life, people are saying, your country is doing the wrong thing. And I got through it, and I thrived. And to this day, there are no economic sanctions on Sudan, and um, I was a large part of that. So. All right. Well, as we promised everybody that we would take a break at, at 45 minutes after, and this has been the fastest 45 minutes that I've spent. You guys are doing an awesome job. So we're going to take a, a short recess, and we'll be back with the second half of tonight's Candidates Forum, brought to you by the Chamber of Commerce, serving Middletown, Monroe, and Trenton. Handout. Chamber of Commerce serving Middletown, Monroe, and Trenton. I'm Lenny Robinson, your moderator for tonight's Candidates Forum for Middletown City Council. And uh, I appreciate all the answers we've been getting. They have been, uh, it, it's been a lot of fun so far and some awesome answers, and everybody here appreciates it. Uh, we're going to move on now. We've talked a lot this first half about economic development. Uh, there has been mention about public infrastructure. It's important. We've talked about roads. Um, I, I want to talk about a couple of things that are on the table right now. City of Middletown just got done negotiating with the Environmental Protection Agency uh, in negotiations about the combined sewers. That's been a topic for the City of Middletown for a number of years. We also are about $100 million behind in paving the roads. So there are, those are a couple of big items. Now, City Council gets blamed for the roads. But I think we all recall back in the mid-'80s, the uh, City Commission then decided to put it to a vote of the citizenry 
we have a, I think it was a 0.25% income tax that people were paying for the roads. And they said, let's let the people of Middletown decide, do we keep this in place or do they want to terminate it? And the vote was made by the citizens of Middletown to do away with that tax. So here we are, 40 years later, going, well, how come city council didn't do anything about our roads? When in fact, the Middletown citizens said, we don't need that tax anymore. So from a policy perspective, we need a lot of money. And it's going to take a long time. The sewers are going to take 25 years to do. The roads, Mr. Mulligan said we do a few million dollars a year, maybe three or four million dollars a year. We're doing $100 million in debt. So let's talk about you are city council. And Monica Nenny, I'm going to begin with you. Would you be in favor of putting the city in debt, bonding out if we could? And this is theory. If we could do $100 million in bonds and then maybe take, because you can only pay so much in a year. Let's say we do it over seven to 10 years. Would you be in favor as a city council person of, of getting $100 million in bonds, using the money that we were going to spend over the next 25 years to pay those bonds back with interest? Because remember, interest is pretty low right now. Or would you still stay on the course of we're going to pull it out of money each year and just take the 20 or 25 years it's going to take to do the streets? As a city council member, what would you do? That's a very important question. Uh, I think that we have an opportunity, we had an opportunity to put it on the ballot and let the citizens decide if they thought that it was something that was worthwhile to pay for. Um, I'm in favor of letting the citizens once again decide, is this something that we think is appropriate? Uh, it's also my understanding that we're almost finally done paying for the removal of the mall in downtown Middletown. And, uh, you know, the idea of putting ourselves in debt is not something that I would necessarily want to take credit for or say, yeah, let's do that. But I do think that the citizens have the right to decide, again, if they think that it's something that's worthwhile. All right, Joe Whitman, what would you do? You're a city council member. Would you put the city in debt? No. Pave the streets? <clears throat> no, what I would wouldn't. You do? And I, when I grew up, our roads were great. And I would say, as a leader of, of Middletown, we need to take it to the citizens. Everybody I talk to, it's roads, 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 roads. So I think we need to take it, put it on a levy, have people vote on it, and I think it would probably pass because you're, you, you know, we're not in horses and buggies, we're in cars that are having damage because of the uh, conditions of our roads. Now, as an aside to that, I've heard that we've started having our own crew to work on roads and that that can be more cost effective. If we could increase that program and create jobs in Middletown while fixing our roads, I think that would be a good solution. Nicole Condry, you're mayor. Do you vote to bond out to get uh, a whole bunch of money to pave the streets fast? Or do we do it over 25 years like we've been doing? So I think anybody who's running who says, I'm going to fix your roads is clearly uh, not thought it through or just trying to get elected. Uh, so this is a long-term problem, and I, I think any, everybody knows that. Um, I, I, I think it ha I, I totally approve of, of voting, having the citizens vote on it, although I have heard that in the past in Middletown that there was a vote to uh, tax the citizens and that the funds were misappropriated. I shouldn't say they were put into a general fund and not used in that manner. Uh, so I don't know the full history on that, but I've heard it from multiple sources. So that's something we definitely need to stay accountable for. Um, and then aside from that, obviously, we need to order more Domino's pizza to fill the potholes. Anyone know about that program? I like that. Mr. Larry Mulligan. Extra sure. cheese or what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pepperoni and cheese, doing both. Now, um, as, you, as everyone probably knows, I put forth uh, last year a proposal to council to consider about an income tax uh, increase, a levy, uh, that uh, potentially could be bonded. Uh, we need to be careful about our numbers. I mean, we do have about $160 million liability in terms of our future road repairs that are needed. So it's a, it's a very large number. Um, a quarter percent income tax is going to raise about $3 million a year. So that's a very small percentage. Well, what it could do is if we did bond a small portion of that, again, not to go out and go crazy, but if we knew we were going to get 
five or 10 years of that if the citizens voted that in. We could bond that and we could really accelerate a paving program that could then build upon what we've been doing. And the whole plan that we've had in place is to get to a sustainable level of government uh, that reduces and controls what we have, but also allocates more funding towards roads. And we've been working down that path slowly but surely, and it's taken some time, but we're at about $3 million a year in, in paving. Could do more. Uh, the state uh, income or state gas tax increase will help us a little bit more next year, but uh, we've got a big liability to face, and um, it's, it's going to take some time. Mr. Levi Kramer, you heard Mr. Mulligan talk about the gas tax increase. Sure. Uh, state of Ohio put through the new mm -hmm. gas tax, but that was because cars are more fuel econ uh, economically, fuel they're, they're better, and we're using electric cars. So is it a zero-sum game, or would you be in favor of what we've heard most of them say, let's put it out to the citizens. Would you be in favor of floating a tax out there, or would you rather bond us? I'd rather do neither of those. I'd rather we prioritize our roads when we look at our budget. We just saw uh, the journal run an article about the city of Middletown having a $1.2 million surplus that we didn't expect, yet we talk about special project this, special project that. Uh, then we see uh, in a uh, budget increase need in public safety to target this homelessness issue. Do we look at that surplus? No, we cut our road spending. Um, it's not a priority. And that's the problem. Um, as, as far as bonding is concerned, you are correct. Interest rates are low. But if you look at our Moody score for the city, it's low compared to um, uh, Westchester surrounding communities. So I don't think that that's the best deal. And I really don't think the answer is to put the city into debt when we are running into surpluses. Now, uh, you know, we talk about that gas tax revenue that, revenue that came in, as well as some funding that was freed up uh, when the Reinhardt's Bridge was completed. That's about $2 million a year, according to the last budget. Uh, you know, we're, we're finding places to pave our roads. Uh, I don't think, it, you know, hitting it uh, on the citizens' pocketbooks is the way to do it. I don't think putting the city in debt is the way to do it. If we prioritize it in the budget, we can find a way to do that. Mr. Hart, you mentioned early tonight about making great roads from the interchange to downtown. How do we pay for it? Well, I disagree with what Levi just said. I, uh... Bonds, bonds are, can be used. I agree with uh, Larry. Maybe that gateway... If you're going to bond something, you, you gateway the project all the way from the interstate to downtown. I, I am not in favor of increasing taxes. I, uh, I'm a fiscal responsible person. I think the budget, there may be some money inside of that budget. I don't think that by reviewing it, you're going to find $100 million. What you do is you create jobs. And it all comes back to economic development. And the only way we're going to have better streets is to, is to bring more income tax into Middletown. And in my opinion, to do that is you go to the private sector, you get rid of the economic development department in-house, and you go to the private sector who sees everything, they're more current, and you bring them here and we create more jobs, and in turn, our roads get paved. Mr. Moon, well, we've, we've circled the, the wagon here, I'm gonna go with you. So, you in favor of debt, you in favor of increasing income through more jobs, um, what's your vision? So I, I certainly agree with John. We've got to have the economic development uh, because that's going to be the revenues for not only uh, future roads, but obviously public safety and all the other priorities. Um, but I'm going to take a little bit different twist on it. Um, I believe what you're referring to was not an income tax increase, but rather potentially earmark. We used to earmark a certain percentage of revenues to be paid for, paid for roads. I've proposed that. I've been trying to rally support for it. I think we need to take between 5 and 10 percent of our income tax and say, hey, we're going to pass an ordinance. It's going to require us and hold us accountable to spend this just on roads every year. I believe we have the money to do it. And that would just be an entry level. Hey, this is the minimum that the, that the, that the residents can count on. We should be doing more than that, but it would set a bare minimum and it would hold us accountable uh, moving forward. All right. Joe Whitman, I'm going to turn to you now. And Mr. Kramer mentioned this just a few minutes ago about the homeless. It's been a hot topic in the city of Middletown. And at an earlier meeting in this chamber this month, Several downtown businesses were down here to complain about the negative experiences going on, including that uh, some other municipalities are dropping off their homeless into the city of Middletown. So as a city council person, what tools would you have at your disposal, you think, to help curb the increase in homeless coming to us from other municipalities? And would, who would you invite to the table to help address the problem? Let's start with you. Well, I would start with our mental health and addiction services people in town. I would talk to access counseling as well. Uh, I think we have to keep in mind we have these things popping up, backpack pirates and that kind of thing on the internet. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that these are people. 
and it's absolutely horrible uh, that people can be transported somewhere where they don't know anybody or know anything uh, about the area and just be dropped off. Uh, they're, they're at the worst stages of their lives. So we have to help them. On the other hand, we can't help everybody. Uh, what I have thought about is an ordinance. Well, first, I think what we should do as a city, if I'm on city council, we would write a letter to everywhere we know that they're coming in from. So that's either hospitals, agencies, or other municipalities. And we say, stop it. And we keep a log of that. Our city manager said that he had made a few phone calls, but that he didn't write any information down about who he talked to, when he talked to them, what they talked about, or what was discussed. Uh, I think that's just wrong. We have to start taking a log and see, and, and making ourselves, making our wishes known to the people who are abusing these homeless people All right, thank you. Or, or addicted people. Cole Condry. I think we could, if I can go further, I think we give that a year, and if the problem persists, then we write an ordinance, and we say it's against the law to bring indigent people into the city of Middletown, and if you do, and if we have you on videotape, we're going to fine you $50,000. Now, I don't think, an, I don't think, I'll just, okay, okay. City X, <clears throat> if we give City X a bill for $50,000, I don't think they're going to write it, but I think we can embarrass him. All right. Nicole Condry, your mayor, and the homeless issue is here. What do you say to the Middletown businesses that are complaining, and what are the tools that you have as mayor to address the situation? Well, first of all, um, I think the, the biggest factor as mayor is communication with our neighbors and that relationship that we have with the leaders of, of the neighboring cities around us, and that's something that I promise I will do is have good one-on-one -on -one relationships with them. And that's not necessarily over the phone. It's not via email. These are things that you could, you have to do face-to-face -face and you have to keep those relationships up. And I think with those good relationships with our neighbors will come mutual respect and mutual understanding and we can do a lot more as a bigger community. Because this is not just a Middletown problem. This problem, if, if you look, it's happening all over the country. And Middletown is our passion is under attack. The passion that Joe has for these people and other and the rest of Middletown has. I mean, we have all these programs here, and that's why people are dumping on us. So uh, we have to to hold our neighbors accountable to also take care of their own as well. Well, I I, can I jump in? Go ahead. I, it's not just our neighbors, but they're coming from Lexington, they're coming from Louisville, they're coming from Indianapolis, or or any other places. And I think we have to take positive steps and try and make this situation go away. I think, I'm just gonna say I was at a meeting and it was with some law enforcement people and there were a bunch of uh, police officers, one was late to the meeting. And he came in and he said, and this is a story I was told, uh, he said, I'm sorry I'm late, I just had to drop a homeless person off in Middletown. I think it's a reputation that we have, sort of like Patsy's, and it ticks me off. And I think we have to take a hard stand and let our neighbors know that it's not going to work anymore. All right, Mr. Mulligan, how do we address the homeless problem? How do we, how do we uh, stop it? How do we control it? How do we handle it? In 59 seconds or less. <laughs> we'll give, we'll give okay. you a minute. Give me a little bit of time? Okay. Well, I will say I do have some great relationships with uh, governing bodies across Butler County and really across the state. And this is not just a Middletown issue we're dealing with. We saw it in Cincinnati. We saw it in Hamilton. See it across the country. Uh, to the points earlier, it is a mental health and addiction issue many times. Many times it's our vets we're dealing with. Many times it's homeless families. So as a region, we need to find solutions for this. And it's going to take an effort to do this. A lot of people allege folks are being dropped off here. We've seen some circumstantial evidence of it, anecdotal stories that come up. But what I've been assured from leaders of other communities is that it's not happening. If someone has a connection to Middletown, someone may be transported here. We'll do the same thing. But it's not happening is what I'm hearing from other leaders. Now, does it happen? I think yes. I think we heard some proof of that earlier this month. So we do need to be compassionate in terms of dealing with folks, but we do need to take a hard stand in saying, we're taking care of our own, thank you very much, 
and we need to be clear with our agencies that provide a lot of that in terms of their self-fulfillment in terms of recruiting folks possibly to, to participate in programs that we need to be clear about what we're willing to support and stand up as a community and address that. All right, Mr. Kramer, on the homelessness situation, um, Mr. Whitman talked about trying to help, help the, the homeless out. So my question to you would be, as a city council person, um, who are you going to bring in to help you as a city council member to help, help the homeless people find stable housing and employment? Well, you have to look at our existing resources. The Hope House is opening that new center. Access Counseling has said, look, we have the funds, we have the availability. We just need a building. Uh, and, and that uh, leads to another point that we need to make here. The city needs to get out of the business of owning property. If we get out of this business of owning property, uh, we can see a lot more land and existing buildings become available so that we can have resources like this come in. Uh, you know, I sat in the city council meeting where Doug Atkins said, look, uh, I don't want a day shelter here because I feel like that would incentivize drop-offs. Drop Yet our, our mayor is saying, well, the drop-offs aren't really happening. So there, there's a communication disconnect there. Um, I, I think that if you are going to look at this population, which is a population in here, uh, regardless of whether or not leaders told us, oh, well, no, we're not bringing them here. We promise you we're not. Uh, they're still here. Uh, we need to look at the private sector and let the private sector do what the private sector does best uh, for those that are truly looking for help, looking for housing, looking for jobs. That's the way you tackle this issue. Uh, you know, I, I, okay. I, I, I'm sorry, I have to disagree with, with Joe on this. We're going to write him a letter and charge him, you know, $50,000. Okay, so then they're not going to pay it. Now what? Okay. I mean, we, we, we need to do something. We embarrass them publicly. And they're very embarrassed and they continue to bring them here. We need to actually do something that's going to provide a solution. Mr. Hart, on, on to you. How, how, do we, how do we find them housing? How do we train them? Do we train them? Do we house them? What do we do? Well, let's, we're, we got to address what's being discussed as far as the drop-offs. And, and I do agree with Joe on an ordinance. I think it, it can be effective, but I think it has to be at the state level. I think if, if every city is held accountable and, and they know that they will lose road tax dollars or road improvement tax dollars because of, of conducting this kind of behavior of transporting and dropping them off, they're less likely to do that because they don't want to lose state funds. And I think we need to get state level help involved in this. Uh, we do have great resources here. We should be compassionate people. It's who we are. And we have an obligation to help. But there is a point where we have to say other communities need to step up as well and, and have the same types of things as the Hope House and, and access and, and day shelters. It can't all fall on our community. And in the state, we need to incorporate state help to say this is a problem. And we need help having other cities and holding them accountable for having programs within their city to help their homeless. Mr. Moon, let, let's have Mr. Moon answer. And Nick, Joe, I, to you. I think there's been a lot of good points made. Uh, I would suggest that um, likely this is going to be a political solution. We need to get the county commissioners from both both of our jurisdictions, uh, Warren and Butler County, involved. Since it is a regional issue, it's probably going to be a regional answer. Uh, I've also forwarded staff uh, some information on something called recovery housing. Uh, it's usually uh, used for uh, addiction issues, but it can also be used for homeless. Um, it's a state program. Actually, Fairfield just had them down to speak, and it, it provides uh, some overnight housing uh, for these type of folks. Um, actually, Monica spoke at the council meeting and mentioned a, a special improvement district, a SID, and that would be something I'd be more than open to for, uh, for downtown businesses to keep not only the residents, uh, but the businesses um, uh, not only safe, but um, just uh, proper control of what's going on down there. And, and Monica Nenny. Yeah, uh, um, like you said, I was one of the downtown businesses who presented the uh, problem that I see as a business owner downtown. And uh, contrary to what our city manager thinks, opening a day center or a 24-hour facility is not a political issue. It is a political issue that our neighbors are dropping people off here and that we can prove it. But I don't think that we should have a negative view of putting 24-hour centers and day centers in our city and, and to provide those opportunities for the homeless people that live here. Um, I think that's really important to recognize. Uh, when I was in Cincinnati, I toured a 24-hour facility called Shelter House that uh, actually houses homeless people who suffer with addiction uh, regardless of their status of sobriety. Um, and it gives them a home first 
and then helps to tackle their um, mental illness and drug addiction issues. This, and I think something like that would be really great for Middletown. Joe Whitman, you had something that you wanted to add. I, I just wanted to add that the city is aware that they're coming from out of town. Uh, the police officers are having, do have bus vouchers now, and they're asking the homeless when they find them, do you want to go home? And if they do want to go home, they're presented with a, a voucher okay. to go back to their hometown. I'm going to move on to another topic. Nicole Condre, we're going to begin with you. And actually, this is, I'm going to start off, and we're going to save some time doing it this way. And, and this was a topic that two years ago was talked about on this floor, uh, and it has to do with Middletown City Jail. And, and I'm just going to do this by a show of hands. How many people are in favor of, of keeping it open? How many people are in favor of closing it? Just a show of hands. How many people in favor of opening it, uh, keeping it open? That answers the second part of that question, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, so Nicole Condry, $5 million to fix the jail, to bring it up to code. How do we pay for it? Well, I think uh, I have some numbers down here from things like $6.19 million of delinquent property taxes in this city. I think we keep people accountable for things that need to be paid for um, and look in our budget for places um, that we can bring that money in. Now, I think economic development all circles back to that as well, right? If we need to bring outside tax dollars in, because if you look at our uh, median income in Middletown, it's what I think something like $36,000 a year. So we can't expect our citizens to fork over all these extra funds to do things like this. We have to bring new business, new jobs to town. Larry Mulligan, your answer on, on keeping the jail, how do we pay for it? Well, I, I think it's a combination of issues. One, uh, we need to recognize our citizens are paying twice because we're paying county sales taxes, which is in the county jail. So they have an obligation to help us out and do some things too. Uh, also, while we, we do have a number of delinquent taxes, a lot of that goes to the schools and to address that sometimes you have to foreclose on those properties and then we end up owning more properties and that's a slippery slide there too. Uh, ultimately, we need to make sure we're delivering a cost-effective service for our citizens, for the, for the court, for the citizens, and for the city. We're investing $1.3 million right now in the operation of the jail. That's about 10% of the police budget. We don't have a whole lot of extra money laying around to throw $5 million at it. So we need to decide if we're gonna keep the status quo and run that out as long as we can and give us time to work with the, par with the uh, county and other partner partners to address this. Um, I understand the police's concern of transportation issues, uh, dealing with um, you know, issues the court faces every day. Uh, they need to have an alternative to address that. But I think we still need to keep it and evaluate it on a very close basis because we're one of maybe a handful of cities in the state of Ohio that have their own jail. So there are other cities that are, have figured this out, and I think we can probably look at this and make sure we're delivering the best value for our taxpayers and our residents. Levi Kramer, you, your hand was up. You said you want to keep the jail. Absolutely, I do. $5 million to fix, and that's just that portion. Um, you've been talking numbers. Where does the money come from? Sure, how do we, let's, how do we get uh, let's solve the jail issue in 90 seconds. So, sure. um, well, 60, but well, go ahead. So, I thought we'd read on a minute and a half on questions. Um, so when you look at that, what you have to do is uh, you have to look at these state regulations. I mean, I'm sorry, this is a jail. It is not a hotel. Um, am I saying that the jail is in absolute pristine condition? No, I'm not. There are some changes that need to be made to it. Um, However, I really think that we need to look at our federal and state legislature to say, look, you know, when you write these jail regulations, there's only five city jails in the state. The vast majority of them are county jails, and that's what was implied when these uh, standards were put in. So if we look at our state and local uh, lawmakers, we can find a way to help bring that cost down. Now, we talk about the fact that the jail currently makes up about 10% of the police's budget, but here's the thing. I've talked to our police officers. I've talked to our former chiefs. They want it. I was one of the first ones to come out and say that jail needs to stay open. That's why I have the endorsement of Sheriff Richard K. Jones. That's why I was able to pick up the endorsement of the Middletown Police Union and why I can announce tonight for the first time I picked up the endorsement of the former chief, Rodney Muterspa. I've been very open. This jail needs to stay open. And we, need to, and, and we need to realize that this is a priority for our police officers as well. So to say that this is, oh, well, it's 10% of their budget, uh, you know, th it appears as though they are okay with that right now. Uh, when we look at the county issue, we are understaffed right now. We look at the fact that uh, we have the same number of calls as Hamilton. We are 45 officers short of where Hamilton is. It's a staffing problem. 
Mr. Can, I, can I jump in there real quick just to clarify a couple things? Uh, to get to the staffing level, we could use that $1.3 million to put more patrol officers on or the street. Or that $1.2 million that. surplus I, I, I just we like had. to finish. What's that? Or that $1.2 million surplus we had. We'll get into that in a little bit. That, that covers one year's worth of thing. The jail's been a continuing expense that we could re reallocate to funding patrol positions. Mr. Hart. So you're, you're in favor of keeping it open? I am. I, I didn't hear a solution. Um, I, you, we're going to so get politically involved and get the state. I, I think our budget is not looked at effectively. Uh, I think it's council. Well, I, well, an example would be, let's say the airport. I'm, I'm heavily in tune with that. And we run the FBO out there for free. And now they're going to incur costs because the city's getting in a private business. And the budget is $600,000 more to operate a business that was being done for free. So I'm saying there's things that go on in our city within our budget that as a councilman, I'm gonna be a businessman and look at it and I'm gonna cut where it needs to be cut and we're gonna, we're gonna get that jail repaired as we can repair it. It may not be $5 million at one time, but I know we can find the money to keep that jail open and to effectively renovate it. All right, Mr. Moon, I'm gonna ask you a question about the jail and we've heard, well, heard Mr. Kramer say, you know, the, the state set up the rules and regulations, but we're not sure we have to follow them because, and I may be paraphrasing, and we can't do it all at once. I'm a private citizen. I'm, I'm a developer. I've said that before. I've got to follow code. I, I can't open my building if I don't get a, a certificate of occupancy. So do we have to fix the jail all at once, or do we do it piecemeal? I think we do it piecemeal. Um, jail populations are a concern throughout the state. There's not enough space in almost any county. Um, I don't believe the state is looking to go in and ticky-tack close a jail. Um, now, if they came in and said, hey, every, every cell has to have a window, we're in a world of hurt because our cells aren't going to ever have windows. Right. Um, but how do we pay for it? Uh, we can look at the impound lot. Uh, there's a little bit of money there every year, not nearly. Uh, I've seen everything from $2 million to $6 million on deferred <coughs> maintenance. I think it's going to be like the rest of the city building, the pavers, uh, the boiler, and so on and so forth. You have to break it off into pieces. Um, and, and work it out through through the through the budget every year. Monica Nenny. Uh, I, I mean, I agree. Working through the budget to make improvements year by year is is important. I think uh, you know it, it's basically been proven through studies that it would cost us more to close the jail. So that's not an option. Um, but we used to uh, allow other neighboring cities to house their prisoners here. We stopped doing that because they weren't paying their bills. But could we find a way to make other cities accountable for those fees for housing those prisoners and go back to that? Let's analyze that. Um, uh, one of our citizens spoke to council and, and recommended that we look at the amount of outstanding bench warrants and the potential opportunity to hire a warrant officer who would go out and help to serve those bench warrants and collect monies that way. I think we've got to uh, talk to the people who are on the ground floor of this and figure out if they've got solutions like those that can help us to make a crack at that, you know, Joe Whitman, improvements. Yeah. your thoughts? Well, I was the last one. I figured. Could I have you, can you move to the microphone just a little bit? Uh, yeah, I am fully in favor of keeping the jail. It, it seems ludicrous to pay officers to drive over to Hamilton or somewhere else and deliver prisoners when it costs $70 a day to keep a prisoner in our jail. The $1.3 million, uh, you know, that is a cost of doing business. A jail is a tool. It's my understanding that jail complies with all state standards as of the last uh, inspection, that there was no problem with it. But isn't that why they need the five million dollars to bring it up to current code? Yeah, to current code. But I think I don't think the state is going to go close the jail over small things. I think we've got enough time to work on it. <laughs> and there was something else. Well, how much time would that be? In, in just ballpark. When you say we have enough time, a year, five years, ten years? What I don't do think from from what I have heard. I don't think. Uh, any jail has been closed by the state of Ohio, so I don't know that there is a time limit on it. Okay. Uh, darn it, last. All right, Larry Mulligan. Yes, sir. We've talked a little bit about public safety um, in terms of, uh, of the jail, and, and we know that crime has dropped over three years. The, the drug problem, the, the police did an outstanding job of attacking that problem, and crime has dropped per the statistics in the city of Middletown. 
But one of the things that uh, city council, current city council got to do was take a look at the city's firehouses. Mm -hmm. And they're all 50 plus years old and none of them meet code. In fact, an architect said in a letter to the fire chief, I had, it, when he was taking a tour, he, he looked at all the pictures in the administrative building part, in, in firehouse over by AK. He said, I noted that all the firehouses the city of Middletown has replaced the firehouses that used to have horses. So we have old firehouses. <laughs> but as everybody's talked about the budget, it's a zero sum game. If we go and, and work with new firehouses and, and try to develop those, where do we cut to pay for it? Well, there's, there's I, I think, two parts to it. One, I think we do need to be diligent about, about our budget. We've talked about getting a sustainable level of government that manages that size. Goes to the points made earlier about economic development, growing our jobs, do what we can there. Uh, ultimately, a lot of it goes back to the issue you raised earlier. Forty years ago, the citizens decided to pull back that um, amount that was allocated towards capital improvements. That included buildings as well as roads. I think it's up to the taxpayers to decide if they want to continue to fund those and provide some things. So I think there's a combination of things between savings, growth, and possibly a levy of some sort to help support uh, new fire stations. Because they're at $3 million or so a pop, they're, uh, it's an expensive option for us. And we need to make sure they're, you know, they're built and responsive for our crews that respond every day. Levi Kramer, your thought on the firehouses. I agree with him on two of those three points. I don't support levy. Um, again, if we prioritize public safety, roads, and job creation, and start cutting wasteful spending, we can find more revenue. I mean, if you look at the fact that, uh, you know, John Hart wanted to talk about the airport. We just repaid that tarmac, $2 million. 1.3, 1.4 of that was directly from taxpayer funds. Uh, I'm not sure where that money came from, and I'm not saying it was poorly spent there. But once that's done, that's money that no longer needs to go there. Those are things that can be allocated over. If you look at firehouses, state grants are options for that as well. Uh, you know, the vast majority of those are what you would consider matching grants, which means the city has to pony up a little bit as well. Uh, but that could cut your cost in half if they're doing halfway matching grants. Uh, we absolutely need new firehouses. We need to ensure that our public safety have the tools that they need to effectively do their job. And that is one of the biggest tools that they need. So we need to prioritize that in our budget and look at where our lower priorities are and start cutting things. Out at the airport. You have, you have a bigger potential for an accident than, for example, downtown Middletown, although there are more accidents in downtown Middletown than there are at the airport. But uh, a firehouse closer to you, good idea, bad idea? It was great when it was there. And when it closed, it, the, definitely the response time. We're fortunate where uh, there's several of us, you know, medics that are on site, uh, private, that can uh, respond and triage before uh, they get there. I mean, the Middletown Fire Department's been amazing out at the airport for the responses, and we've used them multiple times. I, uh, I agree. We don't ask the state for enough sometimes. I don't know how much money we've ever asked the state for. Uh, I, I was talking with Representative Keller, and, and she says no one's ever asked you know, for the projects. Well, if we don't ask, we're not going to get it. I do agree with Levi. We need to go out and look for those things with the state. If the funds are available and it's not something we have to pay back, we should look for those funds. Uh, but I would like to have a closer firehouse out there. I mean, there could be a day where an airplane crashes and uh, we don't have a firehouse that's close enough to respond. On well, response time, the Ohio chief uh, report. Go ahead. You, you have I just want to jump in. Uh, lighting, runway, we're, we're state grants uh, or federal grants. I, I forget which. It's about a 10 or 15% match, so that's what the city's paying, 10 or 15%. So we've leveraged those. We've been highly successful at securing those grants the last several years. Um, if I can just keep going on. Sure, go ahead. Well, all right. oh, I was going to jump in the state capital grants. We've been pretty generous sure. with that. And the latest run, run that I heard was that they are not funding projects like police stations or firehouses in terms of the state house. So, yeah. so jumping back, I, I want to point out that we've gone from 13 men on a shift when I started three and a half years ago to having 17 firefighters on a shift. Uh, credit to them and their negotiators for, for, for all the work they've done. Uh, that's certainly a positive development. As to how we get the new fire stations, I'm an insurance agent by day. Um, obviously, fire protection is of crucial import importance. I'm 38 years old. We haven't built a fire station in my lifetime. Think about all the homes that have been built in the last 38 years and where they are. We don't really have proper fire protection on the east side of the city. How we do it, I think it's silly that we have all these communities that have firehouses a mile or two miles apart. Why can we not partner with a neighboring community to, to build a fire station? And why could it not be done on donated land? When Atrium Hospital was built, there was a provision in that contract, it's long since lapsed, that we were to, to be donated several acres there. Why couldn't we have used that for a fire station? Monica Netti, the Ohio Fire Chiefs Association report came out in January that said the response time 
for the city of Middletown, and, and I'm going to be close on the number, not precise, is about four minutes and 20 seconds from the time they get the alarm to the time they should be at the scene. And average response time in Middletown can be almost twice as much. And we've seen that out on the East End with a, a fire recently in Renaissance. So what's your opinion? Mr. Moon talked about having a firehouse on the East End. Yes, no? How do we pay for it? Yeah, I mean, I think he basically directly addressed that issue of the East End and our responsibility to provide services to these neighborhoods that we are adding and annexing and uh, and building out there. I think it's important. Um, I, in reading about the report and what was going on with the uh, fire stations, uh, read something about the opportunity for a public-private partnership as a way to fund these uh, the building of these projects. I mean, as a developer, I imagine that would be something that people would uh, be interested in and that we could uh, put out to other uh, other communities and other developers to, to find someone to help us in that way, in that type of partnership, uh, afford to put some new firehouses in locations that we identify as important to our city, uh, new locations. So, Joe Whitman, firehouses, one, two, three, four, how many do we build? Do we build them all at once, one at a time? How do we pay for them? I think there's still a study going on on that to see the proper placement of the new firehouses. I can tell you I was out in the firehouses last week and the conditions that our firefighters are working in are just deplorable. When, when they come back after runs and they're covered with bed bugs and they have to take a shower, there may be one shower for three guys and two of them have to stand outside in paper suits. They are bringing in washers and dryers on their own time and installing them. I, I have so much respect for the firefighters of Middletown. They've been doing a fantastic job with less than stellar resources. Right. I, I know one issue uh, at Station 5, I think it's Station 5, at Central and Braille, where they have had uh, cars come off of Braille Boulevard and run into the firehouse. There's Jersey barriers there now, but what the firemen really want is a guardrail because the station is built lower than the street level. So as a car comes off a of Braille Boulevard, it goes airborne, and they sleep in the front of that firehouse, and we, they deserve better than that. All right, thank you. Yep. Last word to you, Nicole Condry. Well, it really does sound like we need to focus on the firehouses. Um, I, I haven't toured them myself, but it's definitely something I want to look into because I'm a huge proponent of our uh, public safety officials, and um, I don't know where to pull the funds from. I've heard a lot of great ideas. In fact, that's what I love about council is I think this is a team effort, and so some great ideas coming out here, and I think it's something we need to address. Also, economic development. I want to broke a record, but if we can bring more businesses here, we'll have more funds, and we can help, help our firefighters out more. Hey, Levi Kramer, you've been talking about this $1.2 million in, in unallocated funds. So uh, city staff identified this money earlier this year and sought the council's input on those dollars and the priority projects. Let's talk about for the 2021 budget. If that $1.2 million reappears for next year, you're on city council. How do you allocate it? What are the percentages? Where do you put that money, what are your priorities? You put it two places. You put a good chunk of it in our public safety so that we can put more officers and firefighters on the streets, help fund these projects we've been talking about the last 20 or 30 minutes, and the rest of it goes to roads. Well, that's $600,000 a piece if we divide it equally. Mr. Mulligan said $3 million for fire stations. We have four and that's $12 million at $600,000 toward that. Is that reasonable? It's a start, and if you look at cutting in other areas as well, I mean, you know, look, if you look at our budget for the uh, last year, we spent, uh, I believe it was right around $2 million a year on miscellaneous. Now, uh, and I'm not saying that should be zero, but I'd like to know where that $2 million went. Uh, and I've spoken with former council members who have questioned department heads, hey, what are you spending your miscellaneous budget on? And very few of them can actually answer that question. Uh, I don't know how much of this is a, oh, hey, we have to spend this so that we get it in the budget again next year, or how much of that is just wasteful spending that needs to go away. Now, if we're looking at just one source of revenue to solve all of our problems, that's not going to cut it. We need to look at our budget as a whole and go in there and start penny pinching. That's how you attack these issues. All right, Mr. Hart, you've got $1.2 million. You're on council. Um, Where does it go? I, uh, 
I hate to say I agree with Larry, but I agree with Larry. And that's that that money may not be there next year. And so to sit there and put officers on the street and then lay them off because we don't have it is not necessarily the right way to do it. I do believe that there are, I don't want to call them special projects, but there are needs of the fire department that we can assess. Equipment, apparatuses, the police department, more dogs, uh, weaponry, vehicles. And I think we need to focus on the things that are going to give them the greatest tools for the limited amount of resources that they have. And uh, even with our public works, if it means another paving machine, get that. You're not going to pave many roads for $1.2 million, or you're going to fix a bunch of potholes, uh, just the cost of doing it. So I think we need to be strategic. I don't think it should go into parks. I don't think it should go into areas that aren't necessarily super critical, but we need to focus on our public safety and put those dollars back into those departments so they can get the tools to be even stronger, considering the, the limited size that they have to work with. All right, Mr. Moon, we've talked about this $1.2 million for this year, and everybody's right. We don't know if it's going to be there next year. So what I've heard has been, let's spend it on, on public safety, the core issues for the city of Middletown. What about the quality of life? Do you put any money of that for parks, recreation, or other things to benefit the citizens? Or do you focus on public safety? Uh, what I suggested this year was uh, a minimum of 50% on roads. Um, I suggested that we continue the recreation program that we brought back this year. We hear quite a bit, um, and maybe it's just the, the circles I run in with a two and three year old from all, all of their friends that they're looking for recreational programming during the day. Uh, that was about $40,000, so not, uh, uh, it's still real money, but not a significant portion of $1.2 million. Uh, and then code enforcement uh, with the housing study and, and the Oakland neighborhood renaissance that, that we're looking to uh, kick off next year. Uh, we're going to have to have code enforcement over there and hiring a new uh, uh, inspector for the certified local government uh, was at the top of that list. Uh, but I agree with John, I agree with Larry that uh, I'm, I am always concerned about hiring employees for any department based on one-time revenues. I want to make sure that those revenues are there every year. That way we're not hiring and then unfortunately having to let somebody go. All right, Monica Nenny, $1.2 million you're asked as a council person to spend it on certain issues. What are your priorities? Yeah, I mean... I think quality of life is important. I think quality of life brings in new <clears throat> residents. It makes Middletown attractive to new businesses and, and those sort of opportunities. So I think quality of life is important to address. Um, I think our parks, at, certainly, I mean, over at Sunset Park, all the work that we're doing there, why not put a little bit extra into that project and, and, and make more of it, put a dog park in or something like something that's going to attract new residents because we keep talking about economic development and the opportunities that we'll have once we have that extra revenue that's coming in. But how do we do that? How do we bring those people into Middletown and tell them, buy a house here, settle down here. You're going to really like it here. I think you know, too often we say, oh, those things aren't important. Let's pave roads. And roads are important. Don't get me wrong. But I do think that we have to stand up for quality of life opportunities as well. And I think downtown Middletown, while we get a bad rap for always being the, always being the people with our hands out, um, I think that quality of life extends to downtown and, and improving that by the master plan. Joe, Joe Whitman, mm -hmm. thoughts? You, you've got this money. You've got the checkbook. Where do you spend the money? After being at the firehouses, I put some money in there. All of it? Some of it? None of it? I'd have to look at it. But I know at that, that same station number five, when it rains, the sewers back up and they can't use their toilets. They can't take showers. I mean, it's deplorable conditions. And we have to take care of the people that take care of us. Our firemen, our policemen are way overworked. They do more work here in Middletown than any other city around us. We're so understaffed and they've been working so hard for so long. I, I have to say it's a, it, it's a tough decision. Mr. Kramer keeps saying he's gonna go to the budget, but what I know about Middletown is our budget has been shrinking for 30 years. It's finally starting to get a little bit bigger, but as budget shrinks, it's not because you have too much money or you're too wasteful. Is there wasteful spending in it? Most likely there is some, but it's not gonna pay for all of this stuff. Middletown has some hard choices in front of it, and we have to start making them. I, I think part of that is being honest with the city, with the people of the city, and letting them know the actual conditions of how things are. Right. It, it's, it's not all roses. All right. 
So we oh, have Col to Nicole Coldry, you're the mayor. As mayor, you know the majority of the Middletown City budget's already accounted for through contracts, through agreements, through personnel. So we have a very small amount to deal with when it comes to actual budget. So you've got this $1.2 million. What are your priorities? What percentage do you spend where? Well, first of all, I, I hear that there is still some back pay possibly for police officers at some point that we are owe them. I would want to look into that because if that is true, we need to make sure we um, help them first and, and make sure we do that. Uh, Joe has definitely made me want to hear some proposals from the fire department. There's no question. If those things are true, we have to address it. Um, so that has to happen, and that has to happen before some of our roads if that is the case. They're true. And, and I believe you, Joe. I'm just... Uh, so, uh, and then I do believe that some of the quality of life things that we can do in the city actually don't cost that much money. So if we can see that we can get our bang for the buck out of um, some quality of life things that are going to really pay off in the long run, we need to look into that and obviously the roads. So uh, I want to see proposals from different groups of what they want and um, how much money it's going to cost. Larry Monaghan, last word. You've got, as you know, being on council, most of the money is, already, money is already spent before you get to it. All right. So you're that and some, and a lot more. So, and so you've got this $1.2 million unfunded. Where does it go? I, I think there's opportunities in a lot of areas to, to spend that on. I think uh, roads is the number one complaint I hear about. I do agree that, you know, the conditions of some of our facilities are not what they have been. I mean, the, the funding just hasn't been there to support those. We came out of the recession. Major cuts were made, holdbacks. Uh, but we need to address a comprehensive solution that's going to be, again, having spent years looking at this budget, uh, I disagree. There's not probably a whole lot of waste laying around there. I mean, it's it's been pretty tight. Uh, when you're cutting positions, people aren't going to be buying staplers and, and tape dispensers. There's not a whole lot of miscellaneous that isn't, you know, real spend. Uh, there are, however, I think some, some hard choices that Middletown needs to face. A lot of communities around us have moved to a higher tax level. I mean, I am a fiscal conservative. I don't like paying taxes. But... Your local taxes are what people see and feel and touch every day. And that's where they have the most voiceover. And I think as council, we need to step up and address these situations and look at them, be honest with everyone in the room and say, if this is what you want, this is what it's going to cost, and this is how we're going to fund it. All right. Well, this has been a very fast hour and a half that we've gone through. I've got lots more questions to ask, but we're going to cut it off. I have one more question before we get into your your closing remarks for each of you will have one minute. You know that the Middletown Police Department represented the city of Middletown proudly, finishing fifth in the country in the Lip Sync Challenge. Amen. So the question to all of you is, Milton's or Central Pastry? Uh, no. I like a book. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, here's the thing, too. I, I, just, really I, I to just heard a from Levi Craig. That's probably the toughest question you've asked all night. <laughs> Can we get to the donut? Category. <laughs> Glaze versus cream filled. Can all right. Um, but I appreciate all of you being here. This, this has been a great night. We've had a lot of good answers, a lot of wonderful debate, discussions. I appreciate all the hard work that you've all done. And so we're going to start with uh, Joe Whitman. I'm going to start with your closing remarks of why people in the city of Middletown need to put a little X by your name come voting day. Central pastry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, saying that because she's got your sign I, up. I love Vera. <laughs> Middletonians have heart, grit, and determination. We are people who try and make life better for others every day. We're a diverse city that celebrates our differences and unites for the common good. We are hard workers who show up and get the job done. We've done it for years and will continue to do so. It's who we are. We're good people doing good things, and it's time for us to join together. Many feel their voices haven't been heard, and as your council person, I will be here to listen no matter your race or ethnicity, no matter who you love, no matter where you live, no matter how you worship or how much money you make. I want to be your voice. I believe that building and strengthening the bonds between us that makes us a community must be a priority, and I believe that will produce our greatest asset. I believe the strengths that will carry Middletown forward will be our openness to change, our sense of ownership of our city, our hope for our future, and a sense of duty to our fellow citizens. Please join me as we work together for positive change, and thanks for coming out tonight. Monica Nenny, your closing remarks. 
Backwards. Backwards. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for coming and for caring so much about Middletown. Um, I'm really proud to call this place home and to have said that I grew up here and uh, sometimes sat in those seats uh, watching my own father sit in this seat and make decisions about our city and make the tough decisions that aren't always easy and don't always make you a popular person. Um, I, I just feel really grateful to have the opportunity to, to sit here and ask, ask you to vote for me and, and put your confidence in me and, uh, and hope that I can and make those decisions that are, that are good for uh, all of Middletown. I'm a downtowner. I have no shame in that. Uh, I love being downtown. Having my business there has been so rewarding for me. Um, and I thank everyone who's patroned my business and helped rebuild downtown Middletown into the place that we see it now. Uh, people walk in, in and they look around and they say, gosh, I can't believe we're in Middletown. It's so amazing. It's so great to see all this change. And what I really want is to be able to take the momentum that we have built, um, take all of the hard work that we've all put in, and uh, and help to build Middletown to be I'm gonna have to ask you to wrap it up. the city that I remember and, and that we all grew up in and, and love. So thank you so much, and, and uh, get out and vote. Tal Moon, your closing remarks. Thank you. I'd like to thank the chamber. Thank everybody <laughs> for coming out tonight to learn a little bit about us. Uh, thanks to the candidates for, for, for jumping in the arena this year. Um, Middletown's a great community with tons to be proud of, uh, but continued changes are, are needed to, to keep moving us forward. I'm the only candidate with private sector experience as a local small business owner and with the critical experience I've gained as your current city councilman. With, with the progress we've, we've made, this is just the beginning, and I want to see it through. I'm working to, to leave Middletown better than I found it, not only more prosperous, but a stronger sense of community, neighbors who care about one another, and a deeper community proud, pride. I love this city and its people, and I'll never stop advocating for Middletown. If you're looking for a council representative that will strive to serve you humbly and honestly, with no agenda other than the betterment of our entire community, I humbly ask for your vote on November 5th. Thank you. John Hart. So I heard a lot of terms used tonight. The last one I heard was council needs to step up. And I agree with that. I think for a council to step up, you need change. And that's a complete change. I think you need to bring in a council that will look out for the people. I believe in hope. I think that's the, uh, the greatest passion I have. And I believe hope comes from loving people and, and working with a compassionate heart. And not just working for the businesses, but working for the people in, in every corner of this community. I didn't think hope existed in Middletown, truthfully, until I started going out and talking to people. And they opened their doors and they, they told me what they're looking for. <coughs> and it can exist here. And as an experienced businessman, I'm going to seek that. Uh, I'm going to look for things, and we're going to make changes. I think uh, our current administration, it's failed us. And I think our council has failed us with this administration. And I think we need to change it. And uh, I'm the right man to be on this uh, council to make it happen. So I thank hope for your vote as well. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Levi Kramer. Yeah. My father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather are all buried at Woodside. Uh, one day, you know, two, three hundred years from now, I'll be there too. Uh, but before that happens, I am going to reflect on my life and say, what did I do to help make my community better? That's my one <coughs> reason for running here. Uh, I have, like I said before, no, no vested interest anywhere in this town other than in the town as a whole and loving the people here. Uh, we need a voice for the people. And that's what I've been running as. Uh, as somebody that will have two ears but one mouth, somebody that's meant to listen to you twice as much as they are meant to speak. Uh, and that's something that I've taken to heart over the, uh, not only these last uh, six, seven weeks campaigning, but, but moving forward as well. We need somebody that will be a true steward to you. Uh, and I, uh, I argue that I'm the person to do that for you. I have experience serving communities this size. I have experience looking at budgets. Uh, I don't have experience as a business owner, but I see that as a plus as well. We, we look at a council of five members, four of the five currently owned businesses. Uh, we don't need a business person. We need a Middletown person and somebody that will listen to you. And that's what you'll get with me. Thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. Those are our candidates for Middletown City Council. There are two seats open. So when you go to the polls, one of these five people, plus Perry Davis, and if you tuned in late, he was called to work unexpectedly and couldn't be here tonight. So six people running for two seats. Now let's go to the closing remarks from Mayor.
Larry Mulligan, I'll start with you. Thank you, Lenny. I'd again like to express my thanks to the Chamber and for everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, best wishes to my fellow candidates. Uh, it's an honor to serve uh, your hometown. It really is. It's been a privilege of the last 12 years. I've been impressed with the progress we've made. It hasn't been easy. Uh, we've had a lot of tough decisions to make over that time. We suffered through the deepest recession in history, but we've come out stronger, and we're doing a lot of great things in Middletown. Under my leadership, I think we've made some great strides. I won't admit to not making any mistakes, because I don't think there's uh, been anyone but one person who hasn't made any mistakes to walk this earth. But however, I think we've got a great future ahead of us. Uh, the bright past, brighter future is the city's tagline, and I think that speaks a lot to what we have in front of us. And I look forward to serving as your mayor for the next four years. Thank you. Nicole Condry, you have the final word tonight. Oh, what an honor. Well, some people have asked me, we've only been in Middletown for just over two years. Well, how dare you run, you know, for mayor? And uh, the way I look at it is I got here as fast as I could. And uh, I've been spent the last 37 years of my life preparing for this. I went and got experiences, and I'm bringing them back here to Middletown, where I'm now calling home. Uh, the other thing is I, uh, I know something about about a team. I know a lot about a team. And I think that this is not only a team, but I have met so many citizens in this city who are now my new teammates. And I put my hand, my life in my hands of my teammates on almost a daily basis up in the sky. And I uh, want to do that with all of you here as well. I've just met so many amazing people in this city that I'm blessed to have had the opportunity over the last few months to get to know in this capacity that I would have never done had I not been running. And uh, I encourage all of you to, at some point, get out there and do the same. So um, I'm proud of being a Middletown citizen, and um, I'm looking forward to a bright future as your mayor in 2020. Well, ladies and gentlemen, these are your candidates, the two candidates for mayor, plus our candidates for Middletown City Council. For all of you that are watching, reminder that all of these people here tonight have done a great task in not only stepping forward to want to represent the city of Middletown, it is no easy task to run for a position of this magnitude. So the best way you can show them your thanks just make sure you get out and vote that first Tuesday in November. Remember, that's the only way you're going to expect any kind of change is make sure you vote for one of these, two of these, three of these people. That's the way you can reward them is with your vote. A reminder that tomorrow night, October 24th, at uh, the Trenton City Council will be the candidates forum for, the, uh, for Trenton City Council. October 28th will be at Madison for the, at the high school gym for the Madison Board of Education. And then October 29th at the Monroe City Building and Council Chambers, for Monroe City Council. So if we can, from our audience here tonight, let's give them a round of applause for doing a great job. And on behalf of the Government Relations Committee for the Chamber of Commerce representing Middletown, Monroe, and Trenton, I'm Lenny Robinson saying, don't forget to vote. Thank you and good night. Thanks for coming. Absolutely. Yeah.